Hello learners, I am Geetika Vadera. Today we are going to discuss the issue of decentralization of educational management. To understand the concept of decentralization, we first need to understand what is centralized system of education that has been prevalent in India for most of the period. In a centralized education system, most decision making, monitoring and management functions are concentrated in the hands of education ministry at the national level and the education department of state government. The central and state governments regulate all the aspects of school education system. They set policy and perform management functions such as paying salary to teachers and providing pre-service and in-service education, formulating curriculum, minimum levels of learning etc. Since in practice some matters might be dealt with locally, school officials are given some powers in day-to-day -day activities. However, teacher or school would have limited scope for changing the syllabus, textbook, medium of instruction etc. in order to be responsive to the children's educational need. That is called a centralized education system. By contrast, a decentralized system is characterized by the exercise of substantial power to the local, district, village or school level on many aspects of education subject to some limited control by the central or state or district level authorities. In practice, most primary education systems have both centralized and decentralized elements. Thus, we can define decentralization as the transfer of decision making authority closer to the consumer or beneficiary. This can take the form of transferring powers to lower levels of an organization which is called deconcentration or administrative decentralization. Popular form of deconcentration in education is to give additional responsibilities to schools. This is often called school autonomy or school based management and may take the form of creating elected or appointed school councils and giving them budget and the authority to make important educational decisions. Deconcentration may also take the form of empowering school directors and teaching faculty to make decisions within the school. Another form of decentralization called devolution entails transferring powers to lower levels of government. Most often education responsibilities are transferred to general purpose governments at the regional or local levels. Examples are the decentralization of basic education to local or district level government in India. When education responsibilities are transferred to general purpose governments, the elected governing bodies of those governments must make decisions about how much to spend on education versus other local services. The measurement of educational decentralization is especially difficult. Economists often measure de decentralization to lower levels of government by looking at the percent of educational revenues that come from local or regional sources or alternatively by looking at the share of educational resources whether they are origin that local government control. However, these measures may be misleading when central governments mandate educational policies or programs that require the local government to allocate its revenue in a certain way. Mandating reductions in class size or the creation of special education programs, for example, reduces the degree of power the local government has to allocate its own revenues or resources. An alternative means of measuring educational decentralization is more subjective and entails identifying the major decisions made regarding the finance and provision of education. Second would be answering the question who makes each decision. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development that is OECD has developed a methodology for measuring the degree of educational decentralization. This methodology divides educational functions in four groups. First would be the organization of instruction, second personal management, third planning and structures and fourth resources. Some educational functions are decentralized even within, within centralized systems and others are decentralized even within centralized system. An OECD survey of its members for example shows that even in centralized systems 
schools make most of the decisions about the organization of instruction. On the other hand, in many countries, most personal management decisions are made at the central level. Measuring decentralization by answering questions concerning who makes decisions in what areas does not provide an easy answer as to how decentralized one's country's education system is relative to another's. Not all decisions are equally important. Indeed, one decision making area is far more important than others. For example, the uh, syllabus curriculum is more important than the method of teaching. So, a shortcut for measuring whether one country is more decentralized than another is to compare the country's policies in personal management. Countries that allow school councils to select school directors and allow schools to recruit, hire and evaluate teachers have already achieved a high degree of decentralization even though school finance may still be highly centralized and teachers may be paid according to national pay scale. Now we would discuss the rationale of decentralization. Why decentralization is needed? What is the requirement? This rationale for de educational decentralization tends to be associated with four distinct objectives. First is the democratization. Second would be regional and or ethnic pressures. Third, improved efficiency. Fourth, enhanced quality of schooling. As I have told with, uh, it is associated with these four distinct objectives. These four object objectives account for most but not all of the reasons for educational decentralization. Implementation of educational decentralization is another major area which has to be looked into. Like other educational reforms, decentralization can result in political winners and losers. The potential winners are those gaining new decision making powers, while the potential losers are those losing those powers. Two of the potential losers, civil servants and teacher unions are sufficiently powerful that they can effectively stop decentralization processes. The civil servants working in education ministries have perhaps the most to lose because some of their jobs become redundant and their power to influence the allocation of resources may be diminished. The leaders of national teacher unions also lose power to extent that salary negotiations, teacher recruitment and teacher promotion are moved from national to lower levels of government. Union members may also fear lower salaries if the funding of education is moved to lower government with fewer sources of government revenues. The implementation of educational decentralization reforms can either be rapid or slow. The legislative or constitutional changes that immediately transfer responsibilities from national to lower levels of government run the risk that lower levels of government will lack the required administrative capacity required to manage the system well. The result may be disruption in the delivery of schooling to children that adversely affects their learning, at least for a time being. A more gradual decentralization can allow powers to be transferred to lower levels of government as those governments gain administrative capacity. The difficulty with gradual decentralization is that it may never occur at all, as the potential losers marshal their forces to fight the policy change. Now we would also discuss school finance, how school finance would be affected with the process of decentralization. The financing of decentralized education can be very complicated in systems where two or three levels of government share financing responsibilities. The choices for financing education in such systems can be framed as follows. First can be central versus local funding. Second, conditional versus unconditional grants. And third, negotiated versus formula driven grants. The choices made concerning educational finance are extremely important as they determine both the degree of effective control local governments have as well as implications for efficiency and equity. The single most important choice is whether the level of government 
providing education as in the most cases it is the local government is expected to generate its own revenues for education from its own tax and other revenue sources or if it will receive the bulk of sources uh, required educational revenues from a higher level government local government's capacity to generate revenues that is from its tax base or its fiscal capacity tends to vary widely across local governments within regions or countries thus requiring local governments to raise their all their own revenues for education ensures an unacceptably high degree of inequality in spending per child a choice has to be made to fund a large portion of primary and secondary education spending from either the regional or national government budgets this funding can be provided in one of the two ways first is money can be transferred from central government to either the general fund of the local or regional government or to a special education fund of the local or regional government in the former case the local or regional government receives funding sufficient to cover a large portion of expected education expenditures but the local or regional government makes the decision of how much to spend on education in latter case the local or regional government is required to spend grant money on education only requiring grant money to be spent on education ensures adequate education spending but reduces the expenditure autonomy of the local or regional government once a decision is made to transfer money to lo uh, lower levels of government a further decision needs to be made as to how to determine what amount of money should be transferred to each receiving government the basic choice is whether to negotiate that amount between governments or to determine the amount using a capitation formula negotiation has political advantages in that it allows central government to reward their political elites and thus it is often popular capitation formulas however are more equitable and may also provide incentives for educational performance since local governments receive more revenues if more students are enrolled and attending regularly the formula has encouraged those governments to undertake campaign to keep children in school however decentralization of educational management also has its limitations the first is that unless the reform is well planned and implemented this its objectives may not be fully realized the second is that funding elementary education and shared distribution of power and responsibility may affect local accountability and efficiency each stakeholder puts the blame on others for not achieving the objectives of education now how has been india's experience with decentralization the idea of decentralized planning and management of elementary education is a goal set by national policy on education 1986 the policy visualized direct community involvement in the form of village education committees vecs for the management of elementary education the plan of action 1992 emphasized micro planning as a process of tracking every child's educational progress regularly and ensures that he or she continues his or her education at the place of his or her choice and completes at least 8 years of schooling or its equivalent several state governments have already initiated the process of decentralizing primary education new legislations have been enacted by state governments to provide for the changed way of operating and creating a responsive system of delivery of primary education and framework for accountability some states have also gone for much closer collaboration and involvement of community and ngos in delivering elementary education at district level on the whole changing from a centralized to decentralized system has been a slow process however the country will continue to work towards the goal of decentralized elementary education by gradually shifting the focus of decision making from state to district sub district and community levels 
the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments have created a congenial ambience for the local self-governments to play a more dynamic and proactive role. This shift has provided voice to women, scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, minorities and others. Then, uh, the DPEP that is District Primary Education Program that was launched in November 1994 has also been so successful that government has decided to adopt the DPEP strategy to operationalize UEE throughout the country. DIET has been given the main responsibility for planning the development of elementary education in the districts Though the states continue to be ultimately responsible for coordinating and monitoring the progress of elementary education. This shift in planning and management strategy requires concerted efforts to train and continually give support to educational professionals and administrators working at the local, urban government and Panchayati Raj institution levels. However, to implement Decentralization in letter and spirit, we must obtain the active participation of local community at the following levels. And who are those uh, stakeholders who need to be involved actively to implement decentralization successfully? They are Panchayati Raj institutions, school management committees, village and urban ward or slum level education committees, parents teachers association, mother teacher association, tribal autonomous development councils and other grassroots level agencies in the participatory management of these elementary education and schools. So learners, today we have learned about decentralization. First we discussed about the differences between centralized and decentralized education system. Then we discussed about the measurement of decentralized education system. We also uh, work, discussed about school finance in decentralization system and their advantages and limitations of decentralized system and the stakeholders who need to be actively involved in this process of decentralization. That's all for this session. Thank you.